So this certainly got my attention from Greater Good Magazine, a science-based magazine out of Berkeley. Ask yourself this question. How does it feel when you're under someone else's control? There is a human desire for control, but we also don't want to be controlled. You can imagine how this affects our relationship with God and our natural ability to, ability to let God go and let God accomplish his will in, our, in and through us. So I'm thinking, any relationship, friends, employment, romantic, it's not pleasant when someone in the many relationships we have are overly controlling. Or worse yet, imagine slavery. Being controlled is no fun. And I'll go a step further. Imagine being trafficked in today's horrendous world of crime. Forced to either work in sweatshops, used in the sex trade, female and male, until you have lost all dignity and all self-worth. People will ask me, and Scott touched on this yesterday, well, why do they use these drugs? Well, imagine waking up every day to the same nightmare. And when you do sleep, if you do, you have nightmares over what your day is going to look like the next day. And I think about Moses and the Israelites making bricks and building for Pharaoh, day in and day out, slaves. Our black community, who not that long ago, on the buses and schools, were segregated from white. There were rebellions and pushback. And look at our marginalized black communities during the, the black communities during the Dr. King era. They fought back by peaceful protest, yet in peace, our dear brothers and sisters were still physically overpowered. Psychologists call this quality reactance. The desire to do the things that are prescribed or proscribed. For example, attempting to control your spouse's diet may be met with an increased consumption of unhealthy food, just to spite you. Overpowering, controlling others have a wide variety of pushbacks. Even peaceful protests would aggravate those in government power because it was seen as you're not doing what you're told when you are told. Although it wasn't about eating your vegetables, it was about life and death. I can say that as my mom isn't here today, but <laughs> she would say, you do what you're told when you're told, and I'll never forget that line as long as I live. It's deep ingrained in my heart. <laughs> Survival and trying to gain dignity again. Some people never regain dignity, but even, or even gain it at all in any way. Some people have never had even the most simplest insight into living a life of dignity. This is why in our adult relationships, you can either have control over others, or you can have their love, but so often, not both. And because love is such a fundamental need for us, being overly controlling isn't good for happiness. There's a related reason why being overly controlling of others lowers happiness. It results in what the well-known motivational psychologist David McLennan calls power stress, which is a tendency to get angry and frustrated when others don't behave the way you want them to. I think we can all relate to that in some way. And I say, I remember the classic lines so growing up. I gave you my favorite already. But in today's society, I'm not sure how much of this even applies anymore. I'm not sure what tough love would be defined as today. But let's save that for a parenting day. <laughs> and certainly not Easter. But I do want to bring attention to this, and I'm not selling his books by any means, but one of my professors wrote an amazing book, uh, Corporal Punishment in the Bible, Dr. Uh, Dr. Webb from Tyndale. Uh, and actually, the American um, Teachers Federation had him come down and speak to their um, teachers about a good way to discipline without the rod. And it's actually quite interesting. So I'll, if you ever want to look it up or ask me about it, I'd love to, to share something, some with you. So this was a great read. It really caught my attention this week, this article from Berkeley. So the things we've mentioned up to this point, wealth, comfort, power, all stem from one theme, control. 
Sometimes we might struggle to give up control, and we may be willing to trade Jesus for it. Jesus gives us the best example in being fully human, even knowing the consequences of relinquishing control and obeying God in spite of it all. Jesus is in Gethsemane. He asks his disciples to pray, which they failed to do when it got in the way of their comfort. As he prays, Jesus wrestles with the emotion he's experiencing, knowing what is ahead. In these times of prayer, he submits control and asks for the Father's will to be done. His passage is directly followed by Judas' betrayal, Jesus' arrest, and Peter's attempt at controlling the situation, and then the scattering of the disciples. I've always been sympathetic towards the disciples on so many matters, including the sleep issue. Why? Because I know I would have likely failed in all the same ways and have failed miserably in some ways and have failed in these times of history when I look back in, in the same ways the disciples have failed. Because I love a good nap when I can grab one. To be very honest, I do. Just like Peter of the New Testament, I would have likely been saying, just 10 more minutes, just 10 more minutes, I'll be good to go, yet remain asleep for the rest of the night. So a commentary by Thomas Constable caught my attention. He says, Jesus had prayed and now met his temptation with strength and dignity, and he overcame it. The disciples had slept and now met their weakness and fear, and they did not overcome because of their response. We have a God who loves us very much. He is also a God who does not control us. While Jesus is Jesus, we recognize that he was fully human in Gethsemane. He moved from asking God to change the plan to understanding and submitting to the only plan that would matter. Loving God does not always mean that we want to face what God calls us to face. It does mean that we choose to face it anyway. Thus, when the test arrives, Jesus summons all his disciples to rise to face it. Ready or not. From our verses this morning, Pam read, Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I don't like talking about the pandemic, but I just will for a second. A global pandemic sent all of us into a new reality, one that challenged our perceptions of control. First, we had no idea how to control the spread, but we tried, even washing our groceries before bringing them inside the house. The pandemic shattered our perception of control, but it's almost comical that instead of running to Jesus, many of us decided to fight back in some way. And I'm not talking about get the shot or decline the shot, but the many ways we want to control the pandemic situation. And now in fairness, there were many things I questioned, but my personality is one that generally works on follow the program if it makes sense. I don't believe the big issues were over how we responded to our personal health care, as that is a personal thing. And it can be pretty volatile to discuss, to be honest. But it was more about the loss of our own control. That was the issue. The need to control is so strong. We just want to do things our way. Jesus helps us to see that doing things our way isn't always best. In one sense, all things are possible with God. We know that. In another, some things are impossible. Jesus prays that if it be morally consistent with the Father's redeeming purpose, that his cup be taken from him, that is what he deeply desires. But more deeply still, Jesus desires to do his Father's will. His deep commitment to his Father's will cannot be doubted. But in this crisis, the worst since the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted to seek an alternative to sin-bearing suffering as the route by which to fulfill his Father's redemptive purposes. Jesus is pleading. He's pleading 
If only this cup could pass. And surely we can understand. As Jesus knew the agony of crucifixion, he would walk by crosses daily. He would see the bodies. He also had a strong relationship with a human heart. As God wrapped in human flesh, he loved his people. He would miss his disciples and his friends, his family. He also didn't want them to agonize over the horror of Good Friday, the torture of watching his death on a cross. He prays in agony, and though he is supernaturally strengthened, he learns that the cross is unavoidable. And if he is to obey his Father's will, he must go through with it. When we consider what we want and how we can control situations, Jesus models looking out for what is best for the whole rather than for himself. Matthew 26, 31 to 35, Luke tells us, we hear that part of the story, but Luke tells us that Jesus was accustomed to go to the Mount of Olives, was accustomed to going to the Mount of Olives, and this is the destination to which he led his disciples. As they walked, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me. Because of me. Matthew is the only writer who uses the expression, because of me. They would become disheartened and scattered, for he is their shepherd. The hope for life as they know it. The joy of getting, of getting up for the day, starting their day with Jesus, can you imagine, would be smitten, and they, as his little flock, would be scattered. But note Jesus' expression of faith. But after I have been raised, I will go, go before you into Galilee. Gives them a promise, hope. The statement was especially appropriate for Peter, who was later restored at Galilee. See, Jesus approached his death believing his father's word that he would raise him up in three days. Peter's self-confidence became presumption when he said that even if all of the other disciples stumbled, he would not. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But Peter was so sure of himself that he said, even if it came to death, he would not deny him. Peter's boldness stirred up the disciples, stirred them up. The disciples echoed the same commitment. So before moving to the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew's account, we, we should note that only John records the acts of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, the lengthy and beautiful discussions regarding discipleship, the lessons about abiding in him, teachings on the Holy Spirit, and the very meaning, meaningful high priestly prayer. The passage shows that, one, Jesus anticipated the disciples' failure, and two, Jesus affirmed his victory. And three, Jesus acknowledged their limitations. Jesus really needed to show the fulfillment of promises here. The disciples and followers had to see that his death and resurrection, the new covenant, could not be kept without a full experience of his victory and his grace. So let's look at Jesus' prayer in the garden. Jesus led his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, which means oil press. Appropriate? Here he would wrestle in prayer over the test before him to be prepared in his spirit to meet his enemies. Leaving eight of his disciples to wait, he took the three, Peter, James, and John, as a small inner circle to be close to him in his anguish. He shared with them that deep sorrow that was affecting him, an anguish so intense and so exhausting to empathize with, with that that they went to sleep. They were overwhelmed by Jesus' anguish. It upset them. This account, while a historical document, cannot be read as a simple historical record, for no one witnessed or heard the prayers of the Master. So it may well be autobiographical that Jesus shared with them following the resurrection. All kinds of possibilities there. But we know the words that were said. It's a moving account of Jesus' separation from his disciples at the fiercest point of his temptation, alone in his humanity. In verse 41, the statement, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, is so often directed to the disciples, yet we could see that Jesus was facing the same battle 
and could just as well have been referring to his tumultuous night. He was ready to do the Father's will, but was wrestling with the limitations of humanness. Three prayers are interfaced with his coming to the disciples for emotional support, only to find them sleeping. The first time, he reproved them. The second time, he seems to have left them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. Luke says they were sleeping for sorrow, worn out by his agony. When we read this, it places the sleeping into another context. Imagine watching Jesus in prayerful agony. It would be exhausting to watch. He, he is the disciples' everything. Yet the Son of God is emotionally struggling in the garden. It's actually heart-wrenching for me to think of this. How would you comfort Jesus? What do you say to the Son of God who you would want to comfort? I wouldn't feel adequate, and would likely, it would likely be the same. I would be exhausted watching it. I wouldn't know what to say. When I'm struggling with emotion, sometimes I escape through sleep. So I really relate to Peter and the James and John on this one. I can go to sleep to escape. But back on track, back to Gethsemane. The more, more important thing is the spirit of Jesus' prayers. Most important thing. His words, Abba, Father, express the closest relationship with the Father as he submitted to, the, to his divine will. His will and the Father's will were one in relation to his passion. And further, he accepted the fact that he must drink the cup alone and fulfill salvation history. The cup was the wrath of God upon the world's sin, the horror of the cross. When we look at the grand narrative of Scripture, and I haven't used that for a while, Isaiah 51, 22 gives us the word. It says, This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. This was the act of entering into that massive covenant between God and hostile humanity that placed upon him the iniquity of us all. He would taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2.9 says, but, do we, but, but we, we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The first prayer was a surrender, as you will. The second and third were supplications, your will be done. And isn't it interesting and confirming for us that Jesus did pray in the way he taught us? The prayer incorporates the petition of the Lord's prayer and the words, thy will be done. And according to the letter to the Hebrews, his prayer was heard. As Hebrew 5, 7 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So on that sidebar, consider this insight into prayer. He was heard because of his reverent submission. This spoke to me in so many ways. When I pray to, to the Father, am I in reverent submission? This is something I will ponder past this morning's message. Absolutely. Faith enabled Jesus to say, the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Having been heard by the Father and strengthened by angelic presence, Jesus returned to the disciples with a victorious spirit. We can't minimize the busyness of God's angelic army. Note that in Luke's account, an angel came and strengthened Jesus. Imagine the encouragement this would give our dear Lord. May we all remember that angels are very real and part of our world and the unseen dimension out there. And they're there to assist us. We read about it, but it's hard to think about these beings spinning all around us 
So don't be afraid to ask for angelic protection and comfort. God may use them, and they sure are real. So after the third prayer, Jesus was composed and ready to meet the mob that was already on the way. His words, sleep on now, could actually be translated to say, it's all right now for you to sleep if you can. Only Jesus in his agony would tell his beloved, get some more rest if you can. We do not know the space of time between the statement and the next, when he said that the hour had come, that the Son of Man was even then being betrayed, that they should rise and join him in meeting the betrayer. On a clear night with the full moon of the Passover season, Jesus could easily have seen the mob coming down the hill from the house of Caiaphas, up the western slope of the Mount of Olives to where he was standing. Jesus is betrayed and he's arrested. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out? as against a robber, with swords and clubs to take me. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Again, Matthew account account follows that of Mark. The one exception is that Mark includes the account of a young man in the garden who fled naked when the soldiers attempted to take him as well perhaps a reference to John Mark himself. So John adds the detail that the crowd fell to the ground at Jesus' words, a demonstration of the power that could well have permitted his escape. All of the gospel writers report that Judas, the betrayer, was with the crowd. But that was no surprise to Jesus. That just reminds me further about the importance of reading the gospels as one big book. You pull so much more from Scripture when you read all four. So Judas, since this motley crew is not all of the people who attended Jesus' teachings, and the crowds in the mount would be enormous at the Passover. So many people there. Jesus wouldn't be easy to find. Judas needed to identify him for them, and he had given them a sign. Jesus would not give the Passover or the Pharisees a sign of his messianic kingship, but Judas dared to give them a sign to betray him. From the original language, Judas said, Hail, Rabbi, a greeting which meant rejoice or I'm glad to see you. How how inappropriate. Totally inappropriate. There he kissed Jesus and the compound word implying that he kissed him much. Jesus' response was friend, comrade, or companion. Imagine the heavenlies, the angels, and a commentator has suggested this. Of course, it's not biblical. It's it's a suggestion. Maybe all of heaven applauded Jesus at that moment. To greet the betrayer with a word of friendship was to say, Judas, I haven't changed. You are the one who is changing, but the door of grace is still open. Jesus' words, why have you come, could mean enough hypocrisy. Do that for which you have come to do. So in the movement of the mob to take Jesus, one of the disciples, who John said was Peter, drew his sword and and struck the ear of the the servant, took the ear off. Jesus rebuked Peter with a statement that lives on in many statements today, outside of Scripture even, people say this statement. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Jesus lived the way of nonviolence. He believed in the active power of love, and gave his life rather than to defend himself. The note in verse 53 shows that 
both Jesus' love for God and his faith in God were genuine. A Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers, and Jesus said that his father could have readily provided him with 12 such legions of angels if he just asked for it. We might well ask why Peter had a sword. We find in Luke 22 that Jesus had responded to Peter's boast that he would die for him by asking how many swords they had. Well, he answered they had two. Jesus said, that's enough. And that could, not, that could not have meant enough for armed conflict, two swords against the Romans. It may have been an expression which meant enough of that. Two swords is a bit of a joke in this situation. Maybe that was another reason Jesus said enough, because it just didn't matter. We only have two and we won't be using them. Jesus made a special point in verse 54 of the fulfillment of scripture, even in the small details. He rebuked the mob for not taking him in the temple where he had taught openly, rather than sneaking out to the Mount of Olives at night when the public wouldn't be a witness. When we talk about the grand narrative, let's think about this and keep in, um, as Isaiah in mind. And we talked about Isaiah this past winter. Matthew records that all of the disciples now forsook him. We have moved in salvation history from national Israel to the smaller faithful Israel to the small group known as the remnant to the lone suffering servant. Jesus is the prototype of his followers who renounce violence. His access to power was not used for his own self-interest. Rather, he lived by the authority of Scripture and its fulfillment. So let's wind down. As we look ahead to the resurrection, we are humbled by gratitude that Jesus did choose to obey unto death. It is a death that paved the way to life. We recognize our humanity and its tendency to manipulate, purchase, or impose power to control our own destinies. And yet we would have no future without relinquishing our whole being to the God who saves us and transforms us from the inside out. And yet we have no future without relinquishing our whole being. We can't grow until we allow the Spirit to rearrange our priorities, our desires, and our need for control. Are we willing to trade Jesus to minimize his saving work to keep our grip on our perception of control? And I believe that the best prayer we can learn to pray as we grow as his disciples is the one Jesus prayed in utter anguish. Not as I will, but as you will. My prayer for you is that God would also send his comforting angels to strengthen, restore you, enable you. If we think outside of the box, remember all the activity buzzing around us, that unseen dimension that is so real and is available to all of us. We are a spiritual people. What we can't see is what we live for. Having the faith to believe in things we cannot see might enable, might enable you to pray, Abba, not my will, but your will. God is listening and he hears. So let's conclude by remembering the words from Hebrews 5.7. It says, again, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Take with you this week, reverent submission. You will be heard. He will hear your shouts of joy, your lament, and your tears. God bless you as we approach Holy Week, a special time in our Christian walk. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there is so much to take in this morning. But we know that as disturbing as it is for us to read and fathom, Jesus went to the cross in obedience. An obedience we need to never forget and must never forget. A love we must hold on to each day. Help us to remember how Jesus prayed in Gethsemane with reverent submission.
Jesus taught us to pray, and may we keep learning how to pray during all the challenges and the joys of life. We will never forget the agony of the garden, and we look forward to the day when we are face to face and we can say, I love you, Jesus, for all you did. When we kiss you on the cheek, it will be with a pure and grateful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.